Hi, everybody, and welcome. My name is Neil Seidman, and I'm the co-chair of the Public Education Committee for ADAA. That's the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. And we're so happy to present the webinar today, Anxiety, Top 10 Reasons Why You Don't Get Better. And our presenter is Dr. Sally Winston. We're going to be recording the webinar, so you'll be able to see it again on the ADAA website. Now, during the webinar, uh, you can type in questions that you have. We want, to, we want to invite you to type in your questions. If you look on the right side of your screen, you should see a Q&A panel. And there's a little field at the bottom of that panel. And you click in it, you can type in your question. Then uh, just hit the uh, enter key on your keyboard or click the icon. And we'll try to get to as many of your questions as we can during the presentation. And before we start, I'd like to say just a little bit about ADAA, the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. ADAA was started back in 1979. And today it's the leading nonprofit organization in the field of anxiety disorders and depression. And our mission is to improve diagnosis and promote the prevention, treatment, and cure of anxiety, depression, and stress-related disorders through education, like this webinar, through practice, and through research. Our goal is to end stigma and to get the word out that these conditions are real, serious, and treatable. I want to invite everyone to visit the ADAA website. It's really an incredible resource. It's adaa.org. And you can support ADAA by making a charitable donation on the website. OK, so I'm really privileged to introduce our presenter. I'm delighted to be here. Dr. Sally Winston is a clinical psychologist and co-director of the Anxiety and Stress Disorders Institute of Maryland. She's a nationally recognized expert in the field of anxiety disorders. Dr. Winston was one of the early members of ADAA, and she's been active with the organization for over 30 years. She has served as chairperson of the ADAA Clinical Advisory Board. And she was also the first recipient of the ADAA Geraldine Ross Clinician Advocate Award. And also Dr. Winston is a co-author of What Every Therapist Needs to Know About Anxiety Disorders. So now uh, let me turn it over to Dr. Winston. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm happy to be here and to talk a little bit about some of the biggest frustrations that people get into when they're trying to get better from anxiety disorders. Um, I'm going to use the word anxiety throughout, um, and that is going to include uh, panic, phobias, um, obsessive compulsive symptoms, and worry. Those are the things that the symptoms that constitute um, the main anxiety disorders. Um, I, I will be happy to take questions along the way. Um, I hope I don't stray too far from uh, from my talk, but I'm going to try to uh, address some questions as they come up. And um, and uh, I do need to say, of course, that I am not. I can't really give personal direct advice but more general educational kinds of information. But let's start with the fact that um, most of the patients who come to us at the Anxiety and Stress Disorders Institute have not been suffering with anxiety symptoms for just a few weeks or even a few months. Most of them have been dealing with anxiety symptoms for years before they ever get to us. And a lot of that has to do with people trying to deal with their anxiety in ways that are not effective and getting demoralized and feeling as if there's 
nothing really that they can do. And what I want to say very, very clearly is that there, that, hope, that hopeless feeling, like it's not going to work for me or, or there's nothing that's going to help me, that's a feeling. Hopelessness is actually a feeling. It's not really a fact. And when we diagnose somebody with an anxiety disorder, we usually say the good news is that you have an anxiety disorder because that means you're really treatable. There are a lot of effective treatments for anxiety disorders, even for people who are skeptical or who have tried help, even tried many different kinds of help, uh, whether it's professional help or self-help. It's also true that no matter how long you've had symptoms or how severe they are, they're still effective treatments. And sometimes the most effective and quick recoveries are people who've been struggling with their symptoms for years. It's also true that you probably know this if you have an anxiety disorder, they run in families. And um, so it makes it feel like, oh, this is just the way my family is. But that is also something that tells us that this is the kind of, treat this is the kind of anxiety that can be treated effectively. Now, let's be clear that not all treatment is equally effective for each person. That may be just the match between you and your therapist, or it may be that the kind of therapy isn't a match for you, or it may be that the medicine isn't the right medicine for you, or that you're on medicine, but really you should be in therapy. There are many different options. If, it's, if you try some kind of a treatment and it doesn't work, I just want to emphasize really clearly, that is not your fault. It means that it was the wrong match or it was applied not well and uh, don't give up. The reason number nine is that you're afraid of treatment. And, uh, and an awful lot of people are afraid of treatment because there are all kinds of myths and things that people tell each other about treatment that scare people away. Um, and so I want to talk about some of those uh, myths. And um, I'm going to just say all of these things that are on the, on the list here, they're all false. One thing I hear all the time from people is that medication for anxiety is addictive and that most people have serious side effects. And that's just not true. Most of, the, most of the people who take medications for anxiety do not have serious side effects. In fact, many of them don't have any side effects at all. Most of the side effects are dose-related, which means that if you start getting symptoms, you can very often just reduce the dose or change things around a little bit and continue to get effective help from medication. Um, and there are several classes of medication that are effective, and if one class of medication you can't take for one reason or another, there are other things to try. But people are always scared of medicine for one reason or another. And I just, uh, just want to say that th that's really a myth. Most of the people that we know that we have on medication um, are taking it without really experiencing any side effects, except maybe for the first few days. Most commonly, it's very mild things like a little bit of a queasy stomach or a little bit of jitteriness um, that interferes with your sleep for a few days. But for the most part, nothing very serious. The second myth is that behavior therapists force you to face your fears, even if you object, and that you're going to be tied down and presented with snakes or forced to go out of your house if you're not ready, or they're going to... Um, push you into circumstances that you really feel you don't want to be pushed into. And let me tell you that behavior therapy is gentle and cooperative, and you find yourself pushing your therapist that you can go a little faster. Um, it, nothing is done as a surprise or a trick. You're a full participant in good behavior therapy. It's I not think that's a wonderful point, Dr. Winston, that, that the way you're describing what it's actually like going to a good therapist is maybe not the impression we get watching some of the TV shows. Oh, those TV shows make me very ambivalent because sometimes they bring forward for people to understand, oh, yes, I think that's me, I have that, like the hoarding shows or obsessive compulsive disorder show, but then the treatment itself is often compressed 
and pushed, and it's not it's not the way it really goes with a, a, a well-trained behavior therapist. So I'm glad you mentioned that, Neil. So it's really a gentle process, and people don't need to uh, be uh, inhibited about meeting with a therapist. No, in fact, uh, one of the things that you do is you cooperatively decide on how the treatment is going to proceed. And one of the first things that good behavior therapists do is they, they start out, and I'm going to talk about this a little more later, they start out explaining everything. Um, nothing is, nothing, you are not expected to do anything until you understand why and you're willing and you understand much more about your symptoms so that you're not scared of them as you proceed. Right. And another myth is that uh, once you start therapy or medication, you're going to be stuck forever and ever in the doctor's office, dependent, always having to take medicine, always having to go to the doctor. You'll stop thinking for yourself. You'll be trapped in therapy forever. Um, and that's a, that's a pretty common uh, um, belief. But many, many of the therapies for anxiety disorder are short-term therapies. Now, that doesn't mean a session or two. It means maybe four or five months. And then what happens is you start coming less and less often, and then you just come in when you're having a problem or you want to refresh your memory about how to handle something, and it kind of fades out gently. But um, the other thing about therapy is that you stop having regular appointments, and it becomes more like you have a relationship with your therapist, but you only go if there's something you need to talk about, which is kind of like, you know, you have with a dentist. You know, you, you go for your checkup, and then you don't go back unless you really got something you want to deal with in your mouth. So the, the therapy pace is according to how well you're doing and if you're getting better. If you're not getting better at all within a reasonable period of time, like no relief, nothing, and it's several months, then you're probably not in the therapy that's matched to you. And that you need to bring it up and talk about that and find some options. Um, the next myth is that therapists want to blame parents, and it's not your parents' fault, and you don't want to talk about painful things from your childhood. You just want to deal with your anxiety. Well, that's kind of old-fashioned therapy for anxiety. Modern anxiety, is re anxiety disorder treatment is really about getting your life in order now and dealing with the symptoms that you have now. And what you focus on in current uh, contemporary therapies for anxiety is what keeps the anxiety going, what keeps the worrying happening, what keeps the panic attacks happening. How are you yourself somehow or other caught in some kind of circular process that keeps your anxiety going? It's very present oriented. Um, at some point, people get curious about things like why, but not at the beginning of therapy. And nobody's blaming anybody. Um, that's just a, an old fashioned idea. Um, some people are just scared of therapy, period, because they know that they are sensitive people. Um, people with anxiety disorders feel their bodies very acutely. They're aware of their senses. They're aware of what goes on in their bodies, sometimes more than other people. They may have very strong emotions about things. And they may feel that they're just too sensitive to put themselves in the hands of a therapist. But the thing about therapy is that we who treat people with anxiety disorders, we know that. And so we approach gently, and we let you control um, what happens in the therapy session. And it is your right and your responsibility to tell your therapist that things aren't going the way you want them to go. Uh, if your therapist can't hear that kind of feedback, that's probably not the right place for you to be. Got a couple of uh, good questions, uh, Dr. Winston. One is uh, from a gentleman in the 60s, but he's not in the in Medicare yet, uh -huh. and really does want to get help. Uh, cannot afford to see a therapist. Has read lots of self-help material. Any thoughts about how somebody could get uh, good help that that doesn't have funds available? 
Well, it's a, unfortunately, that's a, um, a common question. Um, most of the um, centers of excellence of anxiety disorder treatment are also training centers. So sometimes there are people in the latter part of their training who are interns or externs or who are, are, are under the supervision of um, a senior therapists who provide sliding scale or low fee therapy. Um, usually you need to go to either a hospital setting or a large group um, center for the treatment of anxiety disorders. And you can go on the ADAA website under Find a Therapist and look for resources in your area um, that are working at centers. And those centers often have people in training that are really looking for the opportunity to treat somebody. And they are usually under very, very close supervision. And they're terrifically enthusiastic, good therapists. So that's one way to do it. Um, so this another, could be a clinic or it could be a hospital. Right, a setting. clinic or a hospital. Mm -hmm. There are some support groups that are free of charge, people who are more experienced and recovered, um, who help other people out just because they want to. Um, I don't know the resources, whether they're available on the website. Do you know that, Neil? Uh, yes, uh, the support group uh, uh, directory is on the ADA website. Yeah, um, so that's another way of getting some free help. Um, oh, we just got a quick question. What about universities? Would uh, that uni be a good place to look? Yes, universities. Um, when they have uh, departments of psychology or um, uh, when they have clinics that are connected to the university, that's another place where people are in training and offer low fee services or sliding. Oh, scale. we just got a helpful comment from one of our participants. She said that she got help once from uh, university setting uh, $5 a session. Wonderful. Good to That's hear that. That's pretty good, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Shall we move on? One more on? quick question um, about medication. Yes. What are the most common types of medication that are prescribed for adults with anxiety disorder? The most common are, are actually called antidepressants. Um, and probably the first line of antidepressants that are, that are prescribed, they're actually anti-anxiety medicines too. And they're actually kind of anti-sticky thought medicines. So they work for both depression and anxiety. They're called SSRIs. And it's the family that includes um, things like Prozac, Zoloft, Paxil, Lexapro, Celexa. That's usually the first line, but there are many other kinds of antidepressants. That, uh, uh, that are also anti-anxiety medicines um, that, um, that sort of get at the anxiety uh, pathways in the brain in slightly different ways. Um, but uh, the SSRIs are usually um, first line. Then you have the old-fashioned tricyclic antidepressants. They actually work very well, but sometimes they have a few more side effects. Um, and then there's the, the S. NRIs, um, I'm not going to spell out what that all is, but there's a, there are some medications that actually um, um, work on more than one neurotransmitter, and they're slightly more complicated, but they are also very effective for anxiety. Then there's another set of uh, medicines called benzodiazepines. And those are, um, those are the medicines like uh, Valium, Ativan, uh, Xanax, things like, and, and the one that is probably the best prescribed because it's the most long-acting and the less, least likely to be habit-forming, and that's clonopin, which uh, the generic is clonazepam. Um, and those are prescribed usually on a shorter-term basis than the, than the antidepressant medications. And then there's all kinds of other things that can be added to supplement and, and um, modify those medications. Um, so there are lots of choices. Just one more quick question before you move on. Uh, I think it's a really good question. If I'm looking for a therapist, what type of training or credentials should I look for? That's a terrific question. There's actually a whole section on the website that gives you a lot of information about the kinds of questions to ask. So I would encourage whoever asked that question to go look at that. 
But basically, you want somebody who is credentialed. Um, most uh, therapists have some kind of credentialing in their state so that it would be a social worker, psychologist, counselor, psychiatrist if you need medication, um, who is licensed by the state or certified by the state. So you want somebody who's been through a process like that. Um, that is your sort of safest way to go. You also want to ask them, do they treat anxiety disorders? And actually, you, you know, just about everybody says they treat anxiety, so you might want to ask them, a little bit about where they got their training or, or, or how they tend to treat anxiety disorders. And if you've done a little bit of reading about anxiety, you can, talk, you can ask questions that are quite specific. For example, if you have OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, if you, you will find that anywhere you look, the treatment of choice is something called exposure and response prevention, ERP. So if you have OCD and you're looking for a therapist, you can say, do you do ERP? And if they've never heard of it, they're probably not the right person. So it's, it's not rude to ask these questions. People are prepared. I talk to people all day long who ask me those kinds of questions. And um, you're, anybody who is not willing to answer those questions is probably not the right person. You can also ask people who have been treated by someone to find out what their experience is. You can ask your primary care doctor for a referral if they have somebody that they trust and they, they use a lot uh, to make referrals. Um, and you can go to the ADAA website where Find a Therapist is there. And people who list themselves in that directory at least are saying that they have experience with anxiety disorders. And it's a good starting place. OK? Oh, I see somebody asked about Buspar. Uh, Buspar is actually for anxiety, and it's not, an, uh, um, it's not a benzodiazepine, so it's in a class by itself. Um, and uh, I did not mention Buspar. So there you go. Shall we go to the next one? Sure. Wonderful. Thank you. OK. Um, OK, now I'm pressing the wrong thing here. OK. So reason number eight. You have no support. Uh, this could be because you haven't told anybody that you need help, or it could be because the people around you don't believe that you should need help. And that sometimes has something to do with stigma. But support can make a huge, huge difference. I wanted to say very clearly there's no shame in having an anxiety disorder. It's a biological disorder, like any other medical disorder. It's partly inherited. It's not your fault that you have it. It's not about your character. It's not weakness. And yet, somehow or other, there's a stigma associated. But let's say that you don't tell anybody that you're seeking treatment. It's really hard to get to appointments. It's hard to put the time aside to practice homework if you have people who are expecting you to do things for them. It's very hard to take pills if, if uh, you have to take pills at certain times during the day and nobody knows that you're taking pills and you have to be secretive about it. It's very hard to process what you're learning when you come home from a session or you're learning something from a book. It's really helpful to talk it over with someone to see if you really do understand what you think you do. It's helpful to hear other people's stories. Um, it's also sometimes it's hard to pay for and get to if you have nobody who can drive you or help you with the cost. Now, let me just say, sometimes families just can't and won't support um, treatment efforts. And I just encourage people who are in situations like that to seek out others who will support you and talk to someone who's not going to judge you and who's not going to tell you what to do and who's going to be able to listen and, and hear you as you process what you're going through. Reason number seven, it's hard to get better from anxiety if you're under constant stress. And there are, whoops, let me get that back there. Um, if you're constantly putting out fires 
and waiting for the next one and dealing with um, family pressures, time pressure, financial pressure, lots of real emergencies, taking care of your kids and an elderly parent and so on. Um, it makes it much harder to recover. It's not impossible. But our systems tend to respond to this kind of stressful environment with a very high level of what we call sensitization, so that it's very, very easy to get symptoms. It doesn't mean you can't get better. Um, it does mean that maybe you can get some extra help or prioritize what you need to to deal with your stressful environment and get some get some of your problems solved. But it doesn't make it hopeless. Again, hopelessness is a feeling. It's not a fact. And we do treat people all the time who are who are needing to take care of real life and somehow or other fitting in the new information and the new practice and the new attitudes that help get you better. So it just makes it a little harder. You should be kind to yourself on the inside. A lot of times you'll read stuff about this is short term and uh, you ought to be better by now and you know and and if you're not and if if it's because of this kind of situation a stressful environment um, then you're not going to get better in that same sort of quick fashion, and it's just going to take a lot more time. That doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. It's just that you're more sensitized and starting off sort of carrying extra burdens along the way. Reason number six. Maybe you're not getting better from your anxiety because it actually is not just anxiety. There, are, you know, anxiety is the, you know, I'm an anxiety person, so, you know, like Eskimos have 23 words for snow. The word anxiety barely means anything to me because there's so many different kinds of anxiety. If your anxiety is accompanied by or part of another problem, that may be the reason why standard anxiety treatment isn't helping. If you're depressed as well as anxious, Treatment for the depression is really, really important because it's very hard to get yourself motivated to do the things you need to do to face your fears or to read the book or to, to um, take part in anxiety kind of treatment. If you're too depressed there's, and you're feeling low in energy and sick and miserable, the depression has to be treated as well. The anxiety by itself um, is not enough. Uh, treatment. Now there's also something that I always want to mention. Um, people call it anxiety, but it's not really anxiety. It's something called agitation. Anxiety is actually about something, like it has words, like I'm worried about this or that, or there's a particular a symptom that I have that's bothering me or I'm scared of. But agitation is when it's you're restless, you can't sit still, you can't finish a thought, you can't concentrate, you can't think. Um, your whole body is just um, running way too fast, you can't sleep, you can't eat. And this actually is not anxiety, it's agitation, but people often call it anxiety. And agitation is actually part of a mood disorder, either major depression or bipolar disorder, and that needs a different kind of treatment. Um, and anxiety treatment and just trying to relax is not going to get anywhere. It makes no dent on agitation. If you're drinking or you're using drugs, then all attempts at anxiety treatment can be undermined. Um, in fact, um, alcohol and many drugs actually interfere with the medications, and they certainly interfere with the learning that has to happen during anxiety treatment. So that's something that can be treated simultaneously along with being treated for anxiety. You can be treated for alcohol or drug usage. Um, usually you just get your kind of education about anxiety. You have to stop drinking and using. Um, and there are programs that, are, that treat both together. Um, and sometimes it's kind of a problem because you need to go to an AA meeting and you're too anxious to get there because you have social anxiety, for example. And you may need extra support or you may need a therapist even to 
understand that you have anxiety and to go with you to the meeting that you need to get to or to help you get started in your recovery. Now, there are some um, autism spectrum disorders like Asperger's syndrome and other kinds of autism that um, um, where one of the prominent symptoms is anxiety. But this will complicate treatment. Um, and it's, it's, it's not as simple as some of the things that I'm talking about or the books that, that are self-help books for anxiety. Autism will actually complicate treatment considerably. And the last one is that um, there are medical conditions that present as anxiety. They also have other symptoms, too but they present as anxiety. And if you do have prominent anxiety symptoms, it's important to go to the doctor, not every week or every time you think of something that might possibly be wrong medically, but to have a screening physical to make sure that you don't have a condition that is actually the cause of the anxiety and something that can be treated quite simply, like thyroid disease or there are various pulmonary conditions, anything that interferes with breathing, like COPD or asthma. There's some heart conditions. There's certainly a lot of GI issues, gastrointestinal issues, that really, if you have them and they're causing you a lot of anxiety, they can be treated. And that can make a huge difference. And then you'll see whether or not you need additional treatment after that's been treated. Dr. Winston, here's a question that I think is on the topic here. Um, is fainting a common symptom of panic, or would that indicate that there's something, uh, no. some physical co-occurring condition that uh, the person should go to the doctor to get a that's thorough a, That's examination? an important question, because one thing I could say about that is, is absolutely Panic attack, a classic panic attack, does not produce fainting. It produces something we call faintiness, because you feel like you're going to faint. But actually, your blood pressure is going up, not down. So you're not going to pass out. In fact, if you were going to pass out for some reason, a panic attack might be a little helpful. But there are conditions where people do, paint, do faint, and they're simultaneously anxious. But that is not a panic attack. There's something called blood injury phobia, which isn't really a phobia, where people have um, a condition where if they see or they even sometimes think about blood, injury, needles, um, a car accident, something gory, um, that can make them faint. And about 4% of the population have that. But that's not a panic attack. And there are also vasovagal conditions that could be uh, going on that cause syncope or fainting. And those people can get very anxious because they know they faint, um, and, but that has to be treated. Um, that is diagnosed um, medically They're using something called a tilt table test where they uh, tilt you upside down and you pass out. And then they can tell what's going on. And there's very good treatments for that. There's also something called dysautonomia. So there are medical conditions. And if somebody knows they're a fainter, they can certainly get anxious. But that is not a panic attack. People do not faint from panic attacks. Very important so, to know. So somebody is actually fainting. If they're actually uh, fainting. They need to get a better medical workup than maybe they've gotten in the past to find I out would, what's going I on. I would absolutely agree with that, Neil. I think that's very good advice because people don't faint from simple, ordinary panic attacks. There's also a kind of thing that's actually a seizure, a temporal lobe seizure, that can look and sound like a panic attack, but it and um, people can you know pass out from that. So there's lots of reasons why this person should go to the doctor. Okay, great. Okay, next. The reason number five: your treatment is not up to date. So this is a specialty treating anxiety. 
Um, and you want to make sure, and this, this goes to the question that I answered before, to ask about the credentials of the person who is treating you. And I talked about that a little earlier. The kind of treatment that contemporary research suggests is the best. It's, it usually be, begins with something called psychoeducation, which means explaining everything to the patient. It doesn't start with asking, why are you anxious? It starts with listening in detail to what your symptoms are and what's going on, and then explaining everything that's going on. And I'm going to make do some of that explaining a little later on in this presentation. Um, so, so what you're looking at is what's going on that's keeping you anxious, not why. Why is for later. And the old-fashioned kind of treatment, psychotherapy, started with why. And a lot of times started with topics that were very, very upsetting and make people even more anxious. So that is, should be done in the opposite order. Um, in the same way, just tranquilizing away anxiety is the old-fashioned way of doing it, giving people tranquilizers and just trying to stomp out anxiety. And modern medication treats the underlying biological causes of the anxiety, not just tries to tranquilize it away. Reason number four, lifestyle changes are no substitute for good treatment, and neither is advice from the wrong people. Now, everybody has read magazines uh, that talk about how to reduce stress in your life and how to have a good a good, healthy lifestyle. But if you have an anxiety disorder, you can exercise and eat right and um, dump the boyfriend that's causing you the problems and try to get away from all the stress in your life, and that is not a substitute for treatment. It might help temporarily. It's certainly a good thing to lower your overall level of stress by doing things like uh, yoga and exercise and eating properly and getting enough sleep. But anxiety disorders are not caused by stress. They're stress sensitive. So that means they go up and down according to the stress in your life, but removing stress alone will not be enough. It's like diabetes. As everybody knows, diabetes is not caused by stress. It's caused by problems in sugar metabolism. But if you are very stressed out, your diabetes is worse. So it's part of the solution, but it's not the whole solution. And one of the problems with avoiding stress is that you start avoiding life. And very often people will say things like, well, you're really stressed out. That's why you're having panic attacks. Why don't you take a vacation? Or why don't you um, do something to reduce stress in your life? And then people will interpret that as something like, well, I find it really stressful to go to a restaurant, so I'll stop going to restaurants. Or I find it really stressful to drive on the highway, so I'll just drive you know, locally. And what happens is that people start avoiding things. And avoidance is the cause of increased anxiety problems. Plus, you start having a, a miserable life. You start losing out on the things that give you pleasure. You start feeling like a fragile person who's got problems. Um, other people start taking care of you because they're worried about you, and the quality of your life actually goes down while you're busy trying to avoid stress. So lifestyle change is simply not enough, no matter what the magazines say. The other thing is that sometimes people try to medicate themselves uh, with the right kind of marijuana or supplements or alcohol or something else that they think. Uh, I think the latest one I've heard is the uh, coconut water. Um, these things might help or they might interfere, but they're poor psychopharmacology. They're not the best way to go about getting help. And let me just add that um, the mental health, and it, you know, there are so many people with anxiety problems that it's a um, financial opportunity for a good entrepreneur to promise 
a complete cure, an instant this or that, if you just buy my product. And if you run into that kind of thing, just back away really fast. Because anything that's suggesting a complete and instant cure is likely a way of somebody making money off a lot of people who have anxiety. So just a caveat there. Um, any questions at this point? Um, so somebody is promising a, an instant cure. It's uh, uh, a promise to instantly part you from some of your money, sounds like. Yeah, that's, that's something you should be very skeptical about. And the, the Internet yeah. is filled with people who, if you type in anxiety cure, you'll get many offers of things to buy. But that's not a very good idea. I noticed we have a, a chat room. There's a question in the chat room about DBT. And you, do you see that question yes. now? Yes. Is, dial, is, dial, is DBT, dialectical behavior therapy, is this a good treatment for anxiety? Absolutely it is. Um, it, it incorporates a lot of the modern treatments for anxiety into a, kind of, a system of skill learning, particularly at handling discomfort. It's particularly good at teaching people how to get through stressful situations, how to regulate their emotions, and how to um, go towards instead of away from the things that are scaring them. So uh, somebody who is uh, trained to do DBT is probably a good therapist to, to go to. Um, now How about hypnosis? We have a question about is hypnosis a good treatment for anxiety? Hypnosis can be a good treatment for some kinds of anxiety. It kind of depends on um, on what the hypnotherapist is doing. But there there are some kinds of uh, anxiety that do respond pretty well to hypnosis. I would not use hypnosis for uh, complicated anxiety. Um, I wouldn't use it for obsessive compulsive disorder, for example. But if somebody has a specific or simple phobia, like um, a phobia of dogs or of uh, swallowing pills or of the thunderstorms, something like that, hypnosis can be, um, can be helpful. Reason number three, and here we're getting a little more abstract. Reason number three, you make too much meeting out of thought. We all have wild, intrusive, weird thoughts. Has anybody not... Uh, stood on a subway platform and had the thought they could jump off or maybe push the person next to them. Is that normal? That's completely to have a normal. Like that? It's completely normal. Everybody has weird, intrusive thoughts. Uh, you know, uh, weird things like, um, oh, I got to feed the cat, and then realizing, oh my gosh, the cat died last year. Or, um, gee, I wonder if my fly is open. <laughs> Or um, just, uh, you know, you're sitting at a stoplight and somebody goes across in front of the, the car really close to you and you realize you could take your foot off the, get, off the uh, brake and kill them. You know, those kinds of weird thoughts happen to everybody. Another weird thought that happens a lot is that when somebody's just had a baby, they almost always have thoughts like, I could drop the baby or... Did I just feel like I was going to do something really bad to my baby? Those are all normal thoughts. But if you're worried about yourself and you try really, really, really hard not to think that thought because it means something that you thought it, you start resisting the thought, you set up a fight, and what happens? The thought gets stronger. Because the more you try to not think about something, the more you think about it. And the fact is, the thought was meaningless. It's just a thought. It happens to everybody. The way thoughts get stuck is when you refuse to have it. Intrusive thoughts, even repetitive thoughts, they're not messages. And yet they might feel like messages. They're not predictions either. And very nice people have very terrible thoughts regularly. But if you're not tolerant of, the, of what goes through your mind, and if you make too much out of it, 
and you start getting scared of your mind and you start thinking it means something, you set yourself up for getting those thoughts sticky. And people with anxious minds are stickier than usual and they get more and more stuck. The other way that things get stuck is people ask unanswerable questions, right? So they ask things like, will my children grow up to lead happy lives? Or what if I get sick? Or, you know, will I be able to handle it when this or that happens? Or they answer questions like, I need to know, I must know exactly what I believe about this or that, even though you have doubts. That kind of search to get to nail something down, which is actually an unanswerable question, that search for certainty, is a problem because you can't have the certainty. You can get reassurance from people. You can go check things on the internet. You can work hard to try and find out the answer to your question. But actually, all that does is raise the question again and again and again. So the general thing that I'm trying to say is a lot of reason why people don't get better is that they take their mind too seriously, as if it's a friend telling you stuff you need to know, instead of, it, there's a lot of garbage in our minds. We all have pop-up trash in our <laughs> minds. And the fact is, if you work really hard to get rid of it, you just get further and further into it, and you encourage it. And so if you're trying to get your mind right, that can really, really interfere with getting better. Well, we are, you know, people often think that the thoughts they have are shameful or horrible or you know, that other people don't have thoughts like that, but they got loud and repetitive because you refused to have them. Dr. Winston, I have a question. Uh, what about all of the material that is in the culture and self-help materials that talk about how we should uh, have positive thoughts and replace negative thoughts with positive thoughts as the way to solve our problems? Well, you know, if it works, that's great. But usually what happens is it doesn't work. You can try that, but usually what happens is the negative thought just comes creeping back in and then you feel like a failure and then you try to apply the positive thought more and you set up this fight People talk about the fight between my rational mind and my irrational mind. That fight itself is what keeps the anxiety going. I was talking to an audience of about 100 people a few days ago. They're all therapists. And I said to them, how many people find that replacing negative thoughts with positive thoughts is an effective treatment? And not a single person raised their hand. So I think that, you know, if it's something that's a mild thing and it's not stuck and it works, I, I'm all for it. But actually, I don't trust that as a, as a reasonable approach to a stuck thought uh, or a worry because you just go back and forth. The worry creeps in. You, 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 talk, you tell yourself the positive thought. And then a little piece of you is looking backwards to check to make sure the negative thought is not coming. That takes a lot of energy, and that monitor gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And, uh, and so I'm not a fan of that method any more than I'm a fan of thought stopping. How many, uh, how many people have heard of this method where you snap a rubber band every time you have a, th a thought you don't want to have? Um, it results sure. Yeah, it results in a lot of sore wrists, um, <laughs> but it doesn't really help because it's part of that taking your mind too seriously and thinking that this thought actually requires some sort of a response. Thoughts that aren't dreaded or, or made taboo or fought against, they just pass on their own. Thoughts move along when they don't matter, not when they don't happen, but when they don't matter. That's actually a message from um, probably the, the very first modern um, anxiety therapist whose name was Claire Weeks. 
who I think, Neil, you probably remember Claire Weeks and read Claire of course. Weeks. But she was the one who started this whole field, and uh, I owe her a great debt. And uh, one of our participants is recommending that people uh, look for her books, and uh, there's an audio available also. Oh, that's right. Well, great. That's uh, hope and help for your nerves. Peace from Nervous Suffering. They have very old-fashioned kind of names, but there's enormous wisdom in her work. So I'm, I'm definitely endorsing whoever said that. Um, you're, you're right on. Reason number two. You are bewildered. What does that mean? It means no one's explained anything to you. The more you know, the better off you are. For example, you need to understand what a panic attack is to not be afraid of it. It's a harmless false, self, uh, harmless false alarm. Or you could call it a cardiovascular workout at, at an inconvenient time, one you didn't ask for, you're standing in line at the bank. But that's all it is. It's not the least bit dangerous to you. You won't faint, collapse, die, go crazy. It's nothing to do with going crazy. Another thing that people don't know is that how you breathe when you're anxious can affect all kinds of sensations your heart rate, your balance, your skin, your vision, feeling lightheaded, feeling depersonalized, unreal. It's not dangerous. It's not the beginning of going crazy. It's because of how you're breathing. It's the way that you're breathing, you're actually changing the percent of carbon dioxide. You've got all the oxygen you need, but you're, you don't have enough carbon dioxide. And so that's what's making you feel like that. Not dangerous, just discomfort. Other things, uh, things get stuck to things so that your phobias can, uh, can multiply and they seem like they don't make any sense. You're not going crazy. And if you go back to when you started to develop a phobia, you'll always find something logical or something happened right after or right next to something else. There's always really a pattern, even if you can't figure it out. The more you know, the better off you are. That's just a basic basic thing in anxiety treatment. Another thing is that sometimes you're thinking that you have one anxiety disorder, but you really have another. A lot of, you know, we used to think in obsessive compulsive disorder that obsessions were thoughts and compulsions were behaviors. But actually, the largest percentage of compulsions are all mental. You can't see them. <coughs> They're either in your head, like counting or saying something to yourself over and over again to try and convince yourself of something, or giving yourself reassurance over and over, or talking to yourself that this can't possibly be true, or you really would never do that, or whatever. So most, com most compulsions are actually not behaviors like hand washing and light switch changing and repeating stuff the way it is in the, on the TV shows. Some things that get called phobias are also OCD, like germ phobia is obsessive compulsive disorder. And claustrophobia is usually panic disorder, because people aren't really scared that the elevator is going to go crashing to the ground. They're scared that they're going to have a panic attack in the elevator. And there's a bunch of other kinds of things, like shy bladder syndrome, where people have trouble going to the, have it urinating in a public restroom. Um, or hyperhidrosis, which is fear of having big sweats, which is, or even just something that people call, I don't have any confidence, which is actual social anxiety disorder. And when you go to a therapist, you're going to take apart the details of what are you scared of. Some people, when they're flying, they're scared the plane's going to crash. But some people, actually more people, are afraid they're going to have a panic attack and either go crazy or do something nuts or draw a lot of attention to themselves, embarrass themselves, or just go through a lot of agony. And that's actually of the fear of flying phobia people, more people are afraid of having anxiety symptoms than they are of the plane crashing, which is, they may also be afraid of the plane crashing, but that's sort of a minor thing. Reason number one, you're actually trying too hard. 
if you're afraid of or you're ashamed of or you're angry at your symptoms and you set up that fight to try to get rid of them and you try to control them, it actually increases them. So a lot of what Claire Weeks was about and a lot of what modern treatment about is about is learning acceptance, um, giving up that control battle, letting non-dangerous symptoms happen, because if you let them happen, they pass quickly. They're not meaning. They don't have meaning you have to figure out. And you, if you just let them pass through you, and you're not bullied by them, and you don't end up avoiding stuff because of things you're hearing in your head about danger, then your life is better. And you change your relationship to your symptoms. You don't, you don't change your symptoms. If your symptoms don't matter anymore, then you don't dread them. If you don't dread them, you don't have anticipatory anxiety. Then what happens is you get less sensitized. And then what happens is you actually get less symptoms. So going at it to control it directly is far less effective. Effort works backwards. What is most effective is the opposite of effort, allowing the symptoms to be there. They're weird. They're sticky thoughts. They're funny sensations. None of them are dangerous. And if you let them be there and you don't get in their way, they solve themselves. And this is actually a quote from Claire Weeks. Recovery occurs when the symptoms no longer matter. So I like to tell a few metaphors before we go to kind of explain what that opposite of effort is. Because um, it's very hard to get it. Your, your mind and your body are screaming at you, do something, because it seems like an emergency. So how do you, quote, accept it? So I want you to imagine now, we're going to talk about a body that has um, panic disorder. And here's, here's the, here, I just want you to imagine this. You're, you're driving in a car. It's an odd car because it's built like the human body. It has a gas pedal, but it has no brake. This car is on a straightaway out in the middle of the country on a straight place. There's nothing on the side of the road. There's no other traffic. There's nothing to hit. It's completely safe. And you're driving 55 miles an hour. And you decide you'd like to stop now. Now you want to stop. So you go for the brake, and you can't find it because there is none. And you flail around the car looking for the brake, oh, no, oh, no. And you accidentally hit the gas over and over again while you're flailing around looking for the brake. That's like the human body. Once you've had a panic attack kick off, it's just going to take its course. It's not dangerous. So what you do in this car, once you finally figure it out, is you take your foot off the gas and you drift to a stop and it runs out of gas. You didn't stop exactly when you wanted to stop, but it didn't take very long. And that's acceptance for a panic attack. Here's another metaphor. Do we have time for one more metaphor? One more quick one. Yeah. One more quick one. You're driving along the road. Um, a big splat of mud comes on your windshield. It's an icky bug. Half a bug, disgusting, it's a bad thought. Well, you can put on your windshield wipers and try to get rid of it, but what you get is you get mess of mud all over your windshield. Or you can decide to do nothing and let the sun dry it up and flake it off, and by the time you get where you're going, no more mud. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Winston, uh, this fabulous presentation. And I want to thank everybody for attending. Uh, you should be getting an email to let you know when a recording of the webinar will be available on the ADA website, so you can watch it again. And please let friends and family know about our webinar series. And finally, consider making a contribution to ADAA so we can continue uh, and increase these kinds of programs. 
So bye for now, and we look forward to seeing you and uh, hearing your questions next time. Bye.